Welcome to a lecture from Chapter 6, Section 2, Subsection 3. This is Video A, which means it's the first in a series, in this case, of two. So there's a Video A and a Video B that will follow. And the focus of these two videos is on sizing engineered wood. And we're going to start off by looking at eye joist, and then in the video after this one we'll look at laminated veneer lumber. Just as a reminder, uh, engineered wood is wood that is made up of pieces that are glued together in some way uh, to achieve some sort of enhanced performance that can't be gotten from simple sawn wood. Hence the term we've engineered the wood. We in this class, of course, are not going to engineer it because it's been engineered by someone else, but we are going to look at the products they've developed and figure out how they can be used uh, in the most logical way. So again we're going to follow their design procedures which are going to look a lot different from what we talked about for sizing solid uh, sawn lumber. When we talked about sawn sections we said they're rectangular and they have the following key design parameters the uh, area is the key issue for shear capacity. Uh, the section modulus is the key issue for moment capacity. And then the moment of inertia is the key cross-sectional property for the stiffness of the beam. And the cross-section of the beam was rendered with a base B and a height H. And the standard size sections are shown in this little diagram in the lower right-hand side. Um, now a simple rectangular beam is something we can cut from the tree and it seems pretty straightforward. The first question we have to ask ourselves in terms of this notion of engineering the lumber is can we change the cross section? For example, in the case of steel we have a material with a very high shear capacity, a high shear stress capacity. That allows us to radically reduce the amount of material near the neutral axis by changing the cross-sectional shape from rectangular to a wide flange section or sometimes referred to as an eye section. In the case of steel there is a manufacturing cost in doing this but no materials cost since this wide flange shape is produced by rolling the ductile steel material into this new shape. In the case of wood we might be tempted to seek similar structural efficiencies by creating a similar shape. So we could imagine beginning with a rectangular section and we could say, well, what if we carved away part of the material in order to make the section lighter? This would be a kind of conceptual ex exercise where we consider removing material from the cross section near the neutral axis. This action seems really questionable from the following points of view. The process would involve cost in carving away the material. Unlike in the case of the steel eye section, the material removed near the neutral axis of the wood beam is not useful anywhere else in the section. In other words, the material is wasted or thrown away or recycled in some way. Um, the, the reduction in the structural burden in the form of the reduced self-weight of the structural member is minimal since the weight of the sawn wood joist is a small fraction of the load that it is capable of supporting and the fraction of that weight that would be removed in this process is even smaller. So a floor with a total uh, live load of 40 pounds a square foot and dead load of 10 pounds a square foot of that dead load roughly 3 pounds per square foot is joist and then we're only going to be eliminating a little bit of that. So there seems to be very little uh, benefit in terms of reduced load. On the negative side, the new shape has, has extreme vulnerability to crushing and or buckling of the web portion of the eye section. The stress at the neutral axis of the eye section is amplified by this change in the section shape since there is less cross-sectional area over which the shear force is distributed at the neutral axis. And finally, the shear stress of the wood is already a concern in the rectangular section and it's going to become even more so in the eye section. Uh, the, these last two points can be illustrated with the following diagram. 
the tree grows with a roughly circular cross section for the trunk and the limb. So on the left we're showing a circle that might represent a limb or a tree trunk. And probably the tree trunk, of course, would be substantially larger in most circumstances than this rectangular section that's shown, which represents a sawn beam. Um, so we should probably show the sawn beam being cut out of the section where it, out of the trunk where the trunk is much larger. But to get all this diagram on one page in a simple readable way, I just drew a circle and I said that's the shape that the tree trunk or the tree limb is going to be functioning with. Um, a tree is designed to be efficient in allocating its material structural resources. Consistent with that notion of efficiency, the tree does not develop its material stress capacity to substantially exceed what is necessary for its limbs and trunks to work structurally with a circular cross-section where there is a large area over which the shear force is distributed. So one of the reasons wood is so weak in shear and where, why shear becomes an issue is in the circumstances under which the tree developed it had no reason whatsoever to develop any higher shear capacity than it had. And it's a pretty rare thing that a tree fails in shear. It's only when we start manipulating the shapes of the wood that shear starts to become a significant issue. For example, when we cut the rectangular section out of the trunk, we're already altering the shape in a manner that is preferentially reducing the area over which shear forces are distributed at the neutral axis. In other words, the rectangular section will have higher shear stress at the neutral axis than the circular cross section of the tree trunk. When we further reduce the material near the neutral axis by carving away the material to create the eye section, we are further reducing the shear capacity of the member. Hence the simple sawn rectangular beam is more logical than the eye section. We might also be tempted to create a wood eye beam by connecting three rectangular sawn sections together. Sometimes this approach is desirable and it works since it can make a much deeper beam. Of course the deeper, deeper beam would tend to want to span further and we need to make sure that we can actually get the rectangular sawn beams in long enough lengths to make this worthwhile to us. Among the things to consider when we create this beam are it requires very reliable glue to connect the sawn boards together. If the boards delaminate from each other, then the whole benefit of the eye section is lost. Uh, typically, in order to make this work, not only would these boards be glued together, but they would be screwed together with screws that will press them together well enough that the glue connection will occur. Making the flanges too wide, this is the second consideration we have to worry about, Making the flanges too wide will increase the shear stress in the web material and it may increase it beyond the capacity of the material. So we have to watch carefully to make sure that we're not inventing this uh, great beam that works well for bending strength or moment strength or for stiffness but then starts to have shear stress problems. A more common example of how we can use some sort of composite action to create an altered shape is to screw and glue a plywood floor decking down to the tops of the uh, sawn uh, joist. Again, the glued interface is really crucial. Uh, in this case, we're creating a kind of T-beam. So you'll notice that this portion right here consist of a top portion or flange and the stem or the rib of the T and then there's another one right here. Um, this helps stiffen the floor a little bit. The glue connection also reduces creaking and sounds from the floor and so people tend to like to do this um, even if the wood sawn uh, joists are adequate both in strength and stiffness without doing it. It tends to produce a perception of a better floor.
in some prefab structures, we actually add another layer on the bottom. Um, this plywood also has to be glued and screwed to the bottom of the joist. Uh, the plywood on the bottom can form the ceiling of the story before, below if it's a multi-story uh, house or building. In effect, the plywood layers on top and bottom of the floor joists form the flanges of an eye section. So here is the web. From here to here is the top flange. From there to there is the bottom flange. So the eye section to which we're referring is this portion right here. Uh, the eye section is much more efficient structurally than the T section. Uh, it does not shift the central axis off and cause certain extreme fibers to go into higher levels of stress. So the eye section is the ideal way to do it. Um, I lived many years ago in a prefab wooden house that had uh, 5 8 inch high quality plywood top and bottom and 2 by 6s and those elements could span 12 feet. So we got much more uh, shallow and much more efficient structural action because of this eye section behavior. Now, in reality, we can create um, an eye section type wood beam. In order to do that, we have to provide a mechanism to imp improve the shear capacity of the wood material. Then we can fabricate a genuine eye section wood beam. The extended, standard example of how this is done is the wood eye joist in which the web is made of plywood or oriented strand board. Plywood consists of alternating layers of wood with the grain and adjacent layers running perpendicular to each other. Shearing plywood requires shearing half of the layers across the grain of the layers to which the material is highly resistant. Wood shears parallel to the grain very poorly or is very resistive to shear across the grain. OSB consists of glued up wood wafers with crossing grain that is almost as difficult to shear as plywood. The web material has to be very effectively glued to the flanges. Otherwise, if they delaminate from each other, the entire point of creating the eye section is lost. This particular image is of the standard Boise Cascade eye joist, which have OSB webs and micro lamb uh, flange material. Or that micro lamb is just a small version of an LVL. So uh, laminated veneer lumber in the flanges, OSB in the webs. There are other manufacturers of similar products, some of which use plywood webs and others in which the flange material will be finger jointed sawn wood, which has to be carefully chosen to be free of knots so that it will perform well in tension. This image shows a structure that incorporates steel, sawn wood, wood eye joist, and laminated veneer lumber. Across the top of this, the ridge line of this building is a deep, sturdy, uh, steel joist that carries half the load of all of these rafters that tie up all the way to that ridge line. The other half is carried by the walls at the other ends of the rafters. All that load that's accumulated from half of the roof comes to the steel beam and then is carried down in the steel pipe column until it gets here where it's carried by a whole slew of um, studs that are nailed and glued together and all that load gets delivered to this header beam over the top of what is going to be a fireplace. For the short spans and light loads, sawn lumber beams are very effective and the least expensive option. So all these color beams up here are sawn wood. These beams across the ceiling portion of the dormer are solid wood. The studs are solid wood. And some of these headers that don't carry much load are solid wood or sawn lumber. For longer spans and lighter loads, wood eye joists work well. So for example, this is an eye joist, that's an eye joist, 
here's an eye joist, another eye joist, and so forth. So these long rafters, we couldn't even get material um, economically in those long lengths out of sawn wood, but the loads are light, and we can get not only long uh, eye joist, but deep eye joist to handle the long spans that are involved. <clears throat> Um, wood eye joists can be typically manufactured and delivered to the site in 60 foot lengths. For heavier load situations, laminated veneer lumber works the best. Uh, LVL has a higher shear capacity than sawn wood and can be manufactured in sizes up to 5 feet by 5 feet in cross section and up to 60 feet long. They're not typically sold, of course, in anything like that cross-section. They're typically pre-sawn to be an inch and three quarters or three, inch, three and a half inches uh, thick or five and a half inches thick. But we'll talk about that in the next video when we're talking in more deal, detail about laminated veneer lumber. The laminated veneer lumber is also used to support the higher cumulative loads. Uh, for example, along the edges of the dormer. So this is not an eye joist, that's a laminated veneer lumber. And this is a laminated veneer lumber because they're supporting the cumulative load of the, of the dormer and all this superstructure up here. This member is also laminated veneer lumber, even though it's pretty short. Um, it has very high shear because of the huge loads that are being delivered down from the ridge line of the roof. Okay, so <clears throat> again, this shows some cross sections of some Boise Cascade joists, and for some reason, they vary their products across the country. So I just picked out some information for Eastern product profiles. Um, across the top, they have various categories like a BCI 4500S 1.8. Um, and uh, rather than worry about uh, what that means, just look at these cross sections and they will tell you uh, what the uh, details are. So there are several of these that have inch and one eighth thick flanges and those flanges might vary from one and three quarter to two to two and five sixteenths to two and nine sixteenths and then they have uh, thicker flanges one and a half inches and one and a half inches and they vary in width from two and five sixteenths to three and a half and here's some stuff on what Boise Cascade calls Versalam which is laminated veneer lumber and so you see examples here and here and here and here of, of their LVLs and these three interior beams are examples of their eye joists. <clears throat> now as I mentioned the engineered lumber manufacturers provide load tables or span tables that you can use to size members for various situations and I just picked out one example that represents a very common situation that we would design for, which is for residential floors where the dead load is 10 pounds per square foot and the live load is 40 pounds per square foot. And you'll notice in this table they've provided three deflection criteria. One is the standard L over 360. There's something they call their three star, which is a live load deflection limit of L over 480. And then they have something they call their four star, which is a live load deflection limit of L over 960. Now, to be honest, in most residences, most people consider L over 360 to produce a very sturdy and satisfying floor. And so this extra stiffness is of suspect benefit, but it certainly is one of the sales pitches for this particular type of structure because it can be made so much deeper than sawn lumber and therefore can meet much more stringent uh, deflection um, criteria. So the ability to achieve such rigid floors is a clear edge for engineered lumber over sawn lumber. Um, the manufactured depths for the engineered lumber are up to 16 inches 
whereas sawn lumber is pretty much limited to depths of 11 and a quarter or 12 inches if the plywood decking is glued to the top of the sawn wood joist. To emphasize this feature or this advantage of the product, the engineered lumber industry has run TV commercials showing an elephant walking across the floor, uh, which was manufactured to these higher stiffness criteria. Um, this chart is put here to emphasize that they can do something that sawn lumber can't, and they're going to emphasize it by including what I would consider exaggerated language, for example. This is our standard deflection criteria right here. And you'll notice at the top they say caution, caution, minimum stiffness allowed by code. Um, that's their way of sort of implying that this is not very good. Um, for most per people's purposes, this L over 360 criterion will be fine. Um, but if you're a person or if you have a client who's particularly concerned about having a rugged feeling stiff, stiff floor, you might want to look at this uh, more stringent deflection criterion of L over 480 or L over 960. And you can settle on some deflection condition in, in between, but you need a piece of software that you can get from the manufacturers that will allow you to set alternate um, criteria. In this case, they're kind of trying to come up with a table that sort of brackets the issues. At any rate, these more stringent design criterion um, may not be that important since most people are satisfied with floors that meet the L over 360 criterion. Um, also, the engineered floors are not necessarily stronger, they're mainly stiffer. Uh, but using the elephants, I don't know why I mentioned this, but they run these TV commercials showing an elephant walking across one of these floors. Using the elephant seems to be suggesting a clear advantage in strength for the engineered lumber, which may not in all cases be an accurate depiction. They are primarily better from a stiffness point of view. Another major advantage of iJoist is that the joist can be manufactured and delivered uh, in very long lengths, approximately 60 feet. So they can be field cut to a variety of lengths with less waste of material. Finally, longer lengths and greater depths allow iJoist floors to span much further distances than sawn wood joist floors, which to me is, for my purposes, one of the most exciting things about these iJoists. We'll talk about that as we go on. Okay, to sort of understand how to use these tables and also to illustrate uh, one of the span advantages of iJoist, we're going to design a floor for a single space that is 24 feet by 24 feet, which is larger in both directions than we could achieve with sawn wood. The joists are spaced at 16 inches on center. There are LVL girders supporting the ends of the joists and the ends of the LVL girders are supported by columns. So here we have an eye joist, here we have an LVL girder, and here we have a column. Okay, so coming back to our uh, sizing table, which we were looking at earlier, for the standard deflection criterion of L over 360, the shallowest eye joist that will span the full 24 feet is an 11 and 7 eighths, deep 90s 2.0 so that's this one right here so we didn't see 24 feet that we're looking at 16 inches on center by the way to start with and so when we scan down here the first number we find that's greater than 24 feet is this 26 feet 10 inches and when we scan across here we see that's 11 and 7 eighths and it's a 90s 2.0 series joists. The other sections that meet that criterion are this one. When we scan further down we get to 25 and if we went down we could also use this one right here. So we can use a 14 inch by uh, 6500S 1.8 or we can use a 16 inch 
6000S 1.8. So while I'm here, ugh, that's not what I want to do. I'm going to go right there. All right, so there are three of those sections that work. And I'm going to have to push that up. Okay. For the enhanced deflection criterion of L over 480, the shallowest eye joist that will work to span the 24 feet is an 11 and 7 8 inch deep 90s 2.0 now here's something interesting that's the same section that we came up with over here which means that for this particular combination of loads spans and available sections we inadvertently met the l over 480 criterion when we were just looking to satisfy the l over 360. In other words, this section right here was clearly well over designed because it spanned 26 feet 10 inches for this uh, less stringent design criterion. And it just turns out that while we were picking that, we were satisfying this more stringent design criterion at the 24 foot span. Um, other sections that meet the L over 480 criterion are 14 inch deep, um, 60S 2.0, and 16 inch deep, 6000S 1.8. The deeper the go, they go, the stiffer and stronger they become, and the lighter the sections can be. It turns out that for this most stringent condition, which is um, twice as stiff as this. So for this extremely stringent, cri stringent criterion, at 16 inches on center, when we span, scan down here, we don't see 24 feet anywhere. The furthest we can go is 23 feet 7 inches with the deepest and heaviest eye joists they've got. So if we want to achieve this criterion, we're going to have to go to a spacing of 12 inches on center. And then we could go up to 26 feet, but our design problem right now is just 24. These eye joists are deeper than sawn lumber joists, but the weight of the eye joist is actually less than the sawn lumber, so there is no need to revisit the baseline dead loan that we calculated earlier as 10 pounds per square foot, which included the weight of the joist. What, as I mentioned, is kind of exciting to me is that we can actually span, uh, even at 16 inches on center, we can span over 33 feet. And if we go to 12 inches on center, we can go up to 36 feet with the span. That's an amazingly long free span. I mean, typically we're limited to about 16 feet with sawn lumber, and now we're going all the way to 36 feet with eye joists. The table that we were just using was for sizing or selecting eye joists for use in standard residential floor situations with a dead load of 10 pounds a square foot and a live load of 40 pounds a square foot. Eye joists can clearly be used in a huge variety of other situations such as shown here where they're being used basically as rafters these slope beams that span from the top of the wall up to um, the ridgeline steel beam that supports the other end of them um, they can be rafters in a wide range of snow and wind load conditions um, Eye joists can also be used for floors with much higher loads, such as document storage. So the eye joist manufacturers provide a wide range of tables for sizing eye joists in all these various situations. These tables can be accessed online. We're not going to go through them for the purposes of this course because we're trying to just 
touch on the subject matter to let you know what's available to you and where you find information. So if you go to Boise Cascade, iJoyce, uh, and Google that online, you'll come up with a whole series of tables for sizing these in various situations. They will also provide you with a huge assortment of detailing recommendations that will allow you to build an entire system out of their products. This building is largely engineered lumber, but as I mentioned earlier, things like these collar beams up here and some of the more lightly loaded um, headers over doors um, are made out of sawn lumber. But this entire structure could have been pretty economically done also purely out of engineered lumber. But this represents a really nice mixture of all of these different uh, wood products that are put together very effectively and very economically into a complete system. So that concludes our video on sizing engineered wood, uh, focusing on eye joists. This is video A and the first in a series, video B, will be focusing on laminated veneer lumber.